Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Smith from First Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. Just, uh, it's good to be back, uh, at least, you know, visiting with you via the internet. Thank God for the uh, technology that we have today, or we would, uh, this wouldn't be possible. Anyway, um, it's good to it's good to address everyone again. Uh, it does look like that uh, unless Governor Hutchison of Arkansas changes his mind, it looks like we'll probably be able to have service uh, <clears throat> our first Sunday service probably going to be May the tenth. We've announced before. He's going to make an announcement tomorrow, I believe, concerning this and what he's going to reopen. Um, uh, I was reading just the other day that he has not, he really has never put a ban on churches. But his statement was, is that I don't feel like I have to put a ban on them because I feel like that ministers want to protect their saints and that they will... Uh, follow suit with the restrictions and bans that we have issued. And he said, I just trust them. I believe that they'll do that. And uh, I think he was right. For the most part, the ministry's tried to honor our government officials and, and have tried to protect our people. Um, but on the other hand, I read that, but then I turned around and read where he was going to release churches, or even though he hadn't put a ban, possibly he'd just make, going to make it known that that uh, churches can reopen their services. So I, I guess I'll wait until uh, he announces tomorrow, and uh, if we're not going to have church before, well, then we'll certainly announce Sunday, but if anything changes, we'll let you know via our, our website on on the internet and we also can post it on Facebook. Anyway, <clears throat> once again, welcome everyone. God bless your hearts. I appreciate every one of you. And on Thursday nights, we've been continuing this Bible study on uh, and possibly finish it up today. We've been finishing the Bible study on the sequence of events that needs to take place uh, before the end of the Gentile world. Uh, of course, number one is uh, that the church needs to be restored. The church would have to be restored to a uh, restoration that it would function like the New Testament church we read about uh, in the end of the Jewish world. Here in the end of the Gentile world, we will have to have a restored church to accomplish the making up of the remainder of the bride and, and the judgment that's in the end of this world. Uh, this ministry will, uh, of the, the latter house, the latter church will uh, be uh, very much a part of bringing judgment with the word of God upon this, uh, the end of the Gentile world. And uh, so, number one, the church would have to be restored. And then judgment, and I'm talking about uh, uh, eternal judgment. It's my position that there's uh, three times in the world that God has administered eternal judgment. The first time was in the early church, in the end of the Jewish world, when Jesus came to this world and then came back on the day of Pentecost and manifested himself. He manifested God fully in the truth of God's word and the demonstration and power of the spirit that the gospel was preached to that whole known world back there, in that known world that God was dealing with to uh, that he had been he had prepared to, to make up the remainder 
or not the remainder, but the uh, beginning portion of his bride. And so let me apologize to you a little bit. I'm having a little bit of, uh, I have allergies this time of year, a little bit of sinus trouble, so I have a little bit of drainage and I just apologize for, uh, for that. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll do my best to try not to uh, let that bother us. Uh, anyway, so uh, there, there's there's three things that the that is mentioned in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, and some of this I'm regressing and rehearsing again because. Uh, I know that everyone is not going to get this. Uh, however, these these uh, uh, addresses that I'm making or broadcasts that I'm making are being taped. And they're on YouTube and they're on our website. And so you can go over them again. Those of you who are studious and want to, you know, get your Bible out and your pencil and paper and, and take notes, hopefully you can... You can uh, uh, make more, uh, you can gain more clarity of it by going over it again if that it would be something that you would want to do. But if not, well, I'm, I'm, I'm re regressing and rehearsing again some of it over. And then there's others that are probably just listening in possibly for the first time. So... Uh, the church has to be restored in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation and the 6th chapter. I've mentioned this before, but it, it mentions in the 6th, I'm sorry, not the 6th chapter, but the 6th verse of the 14th chapter. The first seven verses is referring to the bride, that was the portion that was made up in the early church. But in the 6th chapter, it says, I saw another angel. I keep saying sixth chapter. I mean the sixth verse. The sixth verse says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This, this is a restore, a, the, the ministry of the restored church. They're, flying in the midst of heaven. They finally get enough power of the truth of God's word and the spirit of God's word that they get up in a heavenly condition. That's a second heaven condition. Having the everlasting gospel, that's a gospel that lasts forever. It's the truth. It, it doesn't have any leaven in it. And so uh, and to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, and that, by the way, that that restored church with that ministry, the church will never fall away again. Uh, and the reason it won't, I'll explain that here briefly. In the end of this world, uh, the Gentile world, in the restored church, we will have a a restoration of the church and God has it fixed where the church won't fall away again. Now, let me explain that just a little bit. The early church fell away and the reason for it is is that because God finished a harvest with the Jewish world and the Jewish people and made up the ma majority of his bride, that portion that was made up back there was uh, primarily Jews. There, no doubt, was a few Gentiles that made the bride back there. Men probably out of uh, Cornelius' hymn and his household. And, uh, and then men like Timothy, he was uh, half Greek, and uh, other uh, Gentiles that came in early back there uh, that worked very close and no doubt they, some of them probably were proselytes and uh, they had enough time 
and were diligent enough that probably did. I do believe some of them made the bride. But for the most part, you have to see the Gentile world coming in. And uh, uh, you remember what Paul said in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts to the elders at Ephesus. He said, after my departure, grievous wolves will come in spoiling the flock, making disciples. He said, men of your own selves. He said, they'd make disciples of, of them own selves. In other words, you know, they would, they would spoil and, and begin to build their own kingdoms. And the apostles would, Paul, when after he fell away, it wouldn't be able to be held intact. And as the Gentile world came in like a flood, I mean, the gen, whole Gentile world had to embrace this and they were embracing it from a much different standpoint than the Jews embracing it after the day of Pentecost. The Jews had that 2,000 year backdrop or platform of God dealing with them through the law of Moses, uh, the prophets, and all of the history that they had been through and God dealing with them for 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ. And uh, so, uh, but down here, the, the Gentile world, the Gentile world, uh, it, it did not have that platform. It did not have that backdrop. And therefore the church had to fall away. God understood that was gonna happen. He was starting with a new people, uh, the Gentiles. And as people came in and tried to put this puzzle of God's word, the anointed word, spiritual word of God, understanding what God was doing and what he had done, what he was going to do. Uh, it was lost. There was so much lost and God just had to allow that to happen uh, and operate in the minds of Gentiles until finally he got them to a place that he could at least start the Reformation, which headed us in the right direction for a restored church. But Look at the many, many years is in the 1500s before even the, the, the restoration started in the Gentile world. Now, let me show you the difference in what's going to happen down here in the end and why the church won't fall away again. It's because God has held the Jews where he's kept them, where he's put them in a great gulf. If you remember Hosea uh, said that after two days, uh, he would begin to add them back. Once they saw him whom they uh, crucified or who they, uh, how's the word he said there? Uh, whose side they, he, they pierced. Uh, that's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was, was, uh, the Jew and Lazarus was the Gentile. And there was a great gulf fixed between the two. The, the, the Gentile wouldn't be able to get to the Jew and the Jew wouldn't be able to get to the Gentile for this great gulf. Well, Paul said in Romans, uh, I believe the 11th chapter it is when he, he began to talk about us Gentiles being a wild olive branch. And here's what he said. He said, blindness in part has happened to the Jew. But he said, how much more of they being a tame olive branch could God graft them back in where he took us a wild olive branch and graft us, grafted us in to that early church, that tame olive branch. How much easier would it be for God to, to graft them back in? Uh, than it was for him to grab the wild olive branch in. And so blindness in part has happened to them, Paul said, until the fullness of the Gentiles come. Uh, and so you're gonna read that. If you go back to, let me make sure I'm telling you right, because I'm talking sort of off of the cuff here in Romans Fairly certain I'm right that it's in the 11th chapter. 
yes. Uh, verse 17 in Rev, uh, Romans 11 said, if, if some of the branches were broken off and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off and I might be, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural olive branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall, uh, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for it is, God is able to graft them in again. For if thou went, were cut out of the olive tree, which are which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted in into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Uh, and if all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. See, uh, and that's what he's saying. He's saying that uh, th there will be a time after the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles, that God will graft the Jew back in. If you see the wisdom of God, he's held the Jew. See, they have never left holding on to the old covenant and looking for a Messiah. They missed him, it's true. They rejected him back there, but God has kept them in a gulf and he's held them right in the law of Moses and in the prophets. So they're still on that platform, even though they misunderstand it, God's got them right there. Now, just like the apostle Paul, he was in the same place they were. He rejected, he couldn't see Christ the Messiah, but when God knocked him down on the road to Damascus, he was, he was able, you know, God opened his eyes. You remember he, he smote him with blindness and had Agabus the prophet go pray for him to heal his eyes. It was just to show him how blind he was that he couldn't see Christ was the Messiah. But once God touched him and opened his eyes, and later in, in uh, the book of Philippians, he, he stated, he said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. He said, you know, if there's any boasting, he could boast about it. But he said, look, I count all that loss. I count I, I, that means nothing to me. Now that I see Christ, I know the old covenant is rolled up and been finished and there's a new covenant in Christ and he is our Messiah. And everything that Paul saw in the old covenant, that's why almost his whole writings is quoting from the Old Testament because he saw Christ in all of it. He said, I, I count all of this loss that I might win Christ, that I might know him in the power of his suffering. He, sufferings. And he said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. He saw what Christ came to do and he saw that he was the Messiah. He saw that he missed it. He certainly repented of it, but God has held, he's held the Jewish people, the, the uh, Israel, even though it's in a, a condition today that is a, a fallen condition. They missed God, but God's held them in this great gulf. 
And after two days, the prophet said, God will graft them back into this olive tree. And when God grafts them back in, they won't have to go through 2,000 years to get their mind adjusted and adapt to everything. They already know all the scriptures and all the history and all the prophets. And they've rehearsed it over and over, even though they don't understand it, just like Paul didn't understand it. But when God touches their mind, God will open their mind and they will begin to come in to this body and receive this message. So you, you, you can look for that as a telltale mark when Jews come back into this body and begin to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and Jewish men begin to receive a calling of the ministry. This will explode in their mind like it exploded in in Paul's mind, I've said often when a Gentile came into this, there wasn't nothing in his mind to explode. They weren't built on the platform or uh, background of the law of Moses, the, the covenant of Abraham, the, the law and the prophets and all the history of Israel. Our background as Gentiles were heathen, worshipers of false gods and, and uh, ignorant not knowing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh yeah, we'd heard about him, but we never knew him and we never, our forefathers never saw him. Or, you know, spiritually, I'm talking about. So God will bring the Jew back in and graft them in. And when this, when he does, they'll get this message and it will, it will mean more to them than it, ha it means to hardly any Gentiles except for those in that last prophetical hour, get it in its fullness. And therefore they will hold, they'll hold this divine order of God. It will not fall away again. Plus the bride will reign with Christ through that ministry and others will be added in. They won't have to be, they'll be spiritual Jews once they're born in and added in it, the, 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 uh, the Jewish state they're in today will, will roll up and they'll enter into this new covenant. They'll see Christ in his fullness and they'll get this just like the apostle Paul did. And so they'll add other, there'll be many others even outside of uh, the Israelites that will come in uh, into the ministry also. And uh, the, the, the bride of Christ will rule and reign with Jesus through that ministry, that that ministry, that divine order of God that is going to take over when the ministry of the restored church finish harvesting this world. And many of the Jews will come in and even take part in that. Some of them will make the bride. But they won't all have time to. Just like Timothy came in, help Paul, Silas, uh, Titus, those men came in. No doubt they made the bride, but and, and those first fruits that come in, they'll come in. Many of them will make the bride, but they won't all have time, but they'll get this message. And then the bride of Christ will rule with, with Jesus Christ through that ministry that will take them down through the thousand years and the church will never fall away again. And that's why, because God doesn't have to start with a brand new people. He'll be starting with a people that he's held in a great guff. My Lord, the wisdom of God is amazing to me, how God put all this together and, and how it's gonna work. So look for, uh, look for the Jews to come in as they come into the body and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're going to be uh, amazed, but it's gonna be a witness to you that we're down in the final hour prophetical hour of this. And so we, our time is getting shorter and, and uh, God is speaking to us. And I don't know where God is in this uh, coronavirus. I, 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 I really don't, uh, but I do, I do believe God is in it. God's getting this world ready. He's getting, uh, he's preparing a way for the image of the beast to be set up. That's one of the next things that's going to take place. I was going to tell you these things in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations, 
that this ministry that's going to fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, and uh, there in the seventh verse, it said, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give, him, give glory to him, for the hour of judgment is come, and worship him, now notice this, worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. See, the heaven, he made heaven. That's the covenant. That's the body of Christ. We'll be in a heavenly place, not just first heaven, but in a second heaven condition at that time. And the earth, the earth is, it's, the earth, you know, when you look at the sea, that's the next thing he mentioned, the earth and the sea. The sea is all on the same level. That's worldliness. It's uh, in the 17th chapter, the angel called the sea peoples, nations, and tongues. It's the world. But the earth, see, is it come up out of the sea. And that represents religion. And the United States is what, religion in the Gentile world produced. It produced the United States, the place where God would chose, and God God is the one that developed it and developed us out of the Reformation. He developed this nation to restore his church in. And the sea, the world, I said, and the fountains of water, fountains of waters. It's also called rivers of waters and fountains of waters. And I'll read more on that in other scriptures here in a little while. But the uh, those fountains of waters is people that it's God's people. But you can you can be in religion and and have a fountain. You can be born of the Holy Ghost. Jesus he said Speaking of the Holy Ghost, for it hadn't yet been given, he said, uh, how did he say it? He said, it will, uh, out of your belly shall flow rivers of water. It would spring up within your own being, just like a fountain. Uh, and and God, that those are God's people. But I'm just telling you now that God's people can use God's, Spirit, the Holy Spirit, it can use it wrong. This that you can have the Holy Ghost, but you can, your Holy Ghost can be become a part of other people that have the Holy Ghost and other religious systems, and it can commit fornication with with the world, worldly religion. And so we have to be careful about that. I'm gonna read you a scripture on that here in a little while. And anyway, it says, and there followed another angel. Now, this one here says to fear God. It don't sound like, that doesn't sound like too much of a message. Fear God and give him glory. Let me tell you something. Since the church fell away, we have never feared God or gave him the glory he's due. Neither have we ever had the awe that we should have for God. But before God's through and into this world, we will have fear, and that's not just being afraid of God, but it also includes being afraid of God's judgment. Because when, when eternal judgment is set up, when the judgment seat of Christ is set up, it's going to be a powerful thing, and it's going to be a serious thing. See, Ananias and Sapphira, they were the first two that we know of in the early church that were struck dead before Peter and the apostles, just for telling what some people might consider even a little white lie. Everyone sold everything they had and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet because of the persecution and the struggle that was back during that time and the apostles distributed. How about that, saints? Do you think you could do that? Can you sell everything you got? And is there a ministry you could trust with that? Don't tell me that we have a restored church and a restored ministry yet that God's going to put in that position. But it, it will happen. It did happen back there. But Ananias and Sapphira made a pact to go in and just 
give most of the money, evidently, and they just held back a part of it. But they told a lie about it, that, that they gave it all. They didn't tell about holding anything back. And God struck them both dead for telling that lie. I'm sorry, but I venture to say that most people today have done worse and they've never been struck dead for it because we're not living in a time when the eternal judgment has come upon us like it did in the early church or like it's going to in the restored church. But we're going to have to realize God's not playing games. We're going to have to be serious. We're going to have to be uh, sober-minded and we're going to have to uh, be faithful and what God calls us to do and shows us to do. See, there's a lot of things that somebody asked me just this week, said, what are we gonna do, Brother Smith? You know, we this body needs some changes. I told him, I said, listen, we're not gonna bring about change. Only God can do that. I said, we have to serve God. The Bible said David served God in his generation, and that's what we're doing. We're serving God right now in our generation and God has us right where he wants us. Don't think for a minute that God can't change us. Look how this coronavirus came just like that. God can change everything. He can shut down economy. He can shut down the civil powers of this world. He can do anything he wants to do and it can happen overnight. God can bring about change. He sets up kings. He puts them down. God, the heart of a king is in the, in the mind of God is the heart of a king. God's in control. And even leaders, God can put them up and take them down right here in this body or anywhere. So you have to understand, you gotta trust God. You gotta believe that God knows what he's doing. Jesus is the head of this and he's all wise. He knows what he's doing. And when it comes time, he will put pressure on this body. He'll put pressure on this world. And I think part of what's going on right now is God putting pressure on this world and getting this world ready for the image of the beast to be set up. And following that, the 10 kings are gonna come. There are several things that has to take place yet, but but I'm, I, I like sticking with the, the positive part of it, the bride being made, the movement of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, the mir miracles and the demonstration and power of the Spirit that's coming. <clears throat> I'm not saying to you that we don't have, you know, any measure of that. Certainly we do. We've got, we have, this body's got a great operation of God in it. But more is going to happen. That's going to be a greater testimony, a greater witness. You remember what Jesus said? He said, I have one that bears witness of me. He was talking about his father and the, the demonstration of the spirit, the anointing, the, the manifestation of God that was with him. If you couldn't believe him, you could certainly believe, <clears throat> you could certainly believe uh, the witness that was with him, that anointing, when you like to have been in some of the services that Jesus held out on the seashore or up on the mountain or uh, under a, a, a palm tree or wherever he preached, uh, the anointing of God that was there and then watched the operation of the Spirit of God when miracles took place. And not only him, after he went back into heaven and sent back the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, and those 12 men had that same power and manifestation and demonstration of the Spirit of God that worked in Jesus, that led that church and brought people into perfection in that 45-year period after the day of Pentecost and harvested that world back there. Saints, we're going to have that happen down here. And uh, the, 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 the things that are coming, the things that have been aren't a drop in the bucket. In fact, business, you know, let me just remind you of the history we have of the new experience uh, 
1953 on the campground. How the Spirit of God moved between services up there and people fell out like dead people all over the all over the grounds. The Spirit of God moved across those people. And uh, uh, I think it was Sister Mills that gave out a message in tongues and Brother Molina interpreted it, laying there in the dirt. And he said, this is just a drop in the bucket of what I have for my people. And I've often said that what God gave us to help us after Brother William Souders passed off the scene, it was great and it caused this body to have enough strength and enough help to go on and continue in the work that God gave us. But he said it's just a drop in the bucket. I've often said what we're waiting on, saints, is the bucket load, the rest of the bucket load that's coming in the restored church. And so uh, I mentioned here last week how the, the fear of God, that how people, just a simple message of, of uh, uh, you know, evangelist, evangelist could give a simple message of salvation and the anointing and power of God would be there so strong that people would get up out of their seats and make their way to the altar. Many fall prostrate. God would touch them in such a wonderful way the fear, the awe, the respect, the, the anointing of God that touched their heart was there. They couldn't resist it. Something even far greater than that is coming back, saints. It's coming back from the early church. That's the first message. Then the next message is Babylon has fallen, is fallen. This ministry will have to judge this Babylonian system and gather God's people. Read the 18th chapter of the book of Revelations where it says a mighty voice. There's a, there's a strong and mighty voice from this ministry that's gonna cry, come out of her, my people. That has not took place yet. That system has not been judged yet. That's gonna take place in the last prophetical hour. The hour of her judgment has come. It, it, the 18th chapter says. And so, yes, there's been a lot of people come out of Babylon. I'm one of them. I was, a, I was in Babylon when I came to the body of Christ. God redeemed me from that. I'm so thankful for that today. And uh, I'm no longer a part of that. But there's still many of God's people out in those systems of religion. I'm talking about Christianity. I'm not talking about any anything else. But I'm talking about Christianity that's filled with confusion and division and separation, a ministry that's not together, it's separated. God's gonna gather his people out of that. It, they will never be able to reform that because it, the foundation of it's wrong. You have to tear the whole foundation up to make it right because the foundation has to, we have to be built on the law and the prophets Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ laid an, an order in that early church and that's the order we have to follow. And all of these organizations are built on a man's organi organization and they will have, they, they have to come out of that and come into the body of Christ. God's gonna do that. He's gonna put together just one body of people he, and, and we're fortunate enough that God has helped us with that. I know everybody out there is using that term body of Christ, but everybody's not the body of Christ. Everybody that's a Christian's not a part of the body. I'm sorry, but you can't state that. When you're in a different body and it's separated from another body of God's people, it's not just one body. There's several bodies out there and they will never come together in one. And so God's putting together his body and he'll, just like in the early church, you know, they were segregated, they were separated. Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, Elamites, Essians, 
uh, the Cretes, they, they, there were many different separations of the people in Israel, had different beliefs. Jesus didn't honor one of them. He started his church. He said, I'm going to build a church and the gates of hell, the gates of hell is preachers. Those are preachers that they, he said, he said, you do shut up the kingdom of God. He said, you take one proselyte and make uh, that proselyte twofold more the child of hell than you are yourselves. It's talking about a religious hell there. And so uh, uh, God has to judge that system. And that's what he, this second message is. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of her fornication. So God's going to judge that system and get all of his people out of that that he can get out of it. And after he does, the sound of the millstone will be heard no more at all in her. The light of the candle will shine no more at all in her. See, that that's God working in there. The grindstone, that's, that's the working on the word of God, the truth of God's word. They're still working on that out there. They still have some measure of truth out there. And then the light of the candle, Jesus is touching them with parts of the sevenfold light. They've got some light. God gives that to them to keep them alive. Those are his children. They've just been caught up in a system where there's a lot of confusion. That's what Babylon means. And they, they don't know how to get out of it. And God's building, he's building a body to get them out of that into the, the truth and lead them in the right way before it's over with. Well, uh, God will judge that system. The light of the candle, the voice of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom will be heard not no more at all in her, dear God. That river Euphrates is going to dry up because God is going to withdraw himself from it, but not until he gets his people out of there. He gives water in the desert, Isaiah said, to give drink to his people. He, he loves them. He's going to keep them alive as much as he can. And so... Uh, that's going to take place. And then the third message, verse eight, said there followed another angel. That's a messenger, this ministry, saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen. I'm sorry, I read that. Verse nine said, and a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image. See, the Bible talks about the beast before this, but now the image of the beast has been set up and you can worship the image of the beast and receive his mark in his foreheads or in his hands. And the saint that do that shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So there's this ministry is going to put the fear of God back in the awe and the respect and the honor back in people's hearts for God through the witness of the spirit, the demonstration of the spirit and the full manifestation of God and the truth. And then they're going to get God's people out of Babylon. And then they're going to warn everyone not to take the mark of the beast or the mark of the image of the beast. Because the wrath of God's going to fall on that. That's going to take place in the end of this world. Uh, uh, the bride. During this time, the bride is going to be made up. Uh, here it says in the uh, 12th verse, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, 
that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. See, there is a blessed time. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth, from this time that this is talking about, in this last prophetical hour, God's gonna make up his bride and that's a time that you would be blessed that you could cease from your labors and enter into God's rest. And he said, I looked and behold a cloud, white cloud, that's the restored church. And upon the cloud one set, and set like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. That's the word of God. His crown, his rulership. And another angel came, came out of the temple crying with a loud voice saying to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. He that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. God's going to harvest this world in the end of the Gentile times, but not until it's going to take a restored church to accomplish that. And notice what he said, him that sat on the cloud, Jesus is not coming back riding on a natural cloud, saints. This is spiritual, symbolic language. And he's coming back in a cloud. You remember when he ascended? An angel said, why stand ye men looking up, gazing upward? For he that descended will come in like manner. See, he left in the clouds, but that was, those were natural clouds. But he's coming back in clouds, but it's not natural. It's spiritual. He's coming back on a cloud. Remember, they ascended to God in the 11th chapter in a cloud. They ascended up in a cloud. That's a restored church. Jesus is not coming back down to cloud level. I hope people get that out of their mind. I'm trying to tell people, if you took the earth and it's round like that, and God's up here at the top, Jesus is up there and he wants to come down, you know, the sea is flat. And if you're out on a boat at sea, you can see seven miles to the horizon because that's where the curvature of the earth is. And so if, if you couldn't see 10 miles off, I've flown airplanes, I'm a pilot. You can be up in the sky, you can see further than seven miles because you can see beyond the curvature of the earth, the higher you get. But... <clears throat> uh, if you was on the sea, you couldn't see anymore. If you're down here on the earth and Jesus came 15 miles off, you wouldn't see him if he just came down to cloud level. You couldn't even see him across Little Rock, Arkansas to the other side. It's spiritual saints. He's coming in a cloud, a restored church, a second heaven restored church condition. Get that in your mind. That's how Jesus is coming back. Oh, um, now <clears throat> I was just telling you he's, I've, I've covered that he's going to graft the Jews back in and into this world as in the last prophetical hour, God's going to add people in. And I think some will come in before that because uh, the coming of the Lord in the early church was about a 45 year period. There's a 30 year period and a 15 year period. The 15 year period is the last prophetical hour. Well, uh, I think we're already in the 30 year period down here. Uh, I, I'm not one that is a stickler for times. I don't, I try not to talk about it very much because um, there's been so much said down through the years, people's, you know, hold to, held on to a year, people would be wrong and, and, and miss it. <clears throat> and, uh, but we should have men that are at least studying times. And if my if if I'm right on times, and I'm not going to talk on that tonight, though the prophetical last prophetical hour would start in 2033. I would say are somewhere around there, but I I, I 2033s where I have it figured it's not only 2,000 years from the day of Pentecost, but it 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 also measures up to the exact time frame 
when you take the four angels loose from the river Euphrates in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations, which is a 360 year period, a hundred year period, a 30 year period and a 45 year period that takes us from when the Reformation was truly established until 2033. I won't go over that right now, but anyway, someone needs to be working on the time frame, and, and I'm not a stickler about it. i am still got my mind open, but you, you don't have to be a student of prophecy like I am to realize that we've got to be in the end of the Gentile world. The end time is coming upon us. <clears throat> You'd have to know that. Uh, and so we're looking for the Jews to be grafted back in. We're looking for this life prophetical hour to take place. One of the things that I will say is, is that uh, the, the, the other thing's got to take place is that the two-horned beast has got to make an image to the beast. And if you want to turn back to the 13th chapter right quick, I'm trying to... I don't know if I can finish this up today or not. <laughs> I thought we'd get on the seven vials, but I hope what I'm saying at least is reasonable enough to make some sense. I don't know, Sister Brenda Ratliff, you mean when it says mine's not. I don't know what you mean by that. If you want to be, if you want to com, com, uh, comment further on that, I'll maybe try to, address it, but I don't know what that means. It may be referring to something I said. Um, oh, I see where Heidi Day says my screen is fine. So maybe she's saying it's not, It's she's not able to see us. I don't know. Anyway, um, if you go back to the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, just to address for a moment here, the two-horned beast. I addressed it last week, but I just want you to get this. Uh, uh, the in the thirteenth chapter in the uh, in the the first two verses is talking about John saw he stood up on the sand of the sea and he saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns the the seven head and ten horn beast rose up out of the sea but in the eleventh chapter after all this takes place, and this is talking about, it's talking about Papal Rome, how it was set up and it ruled over the whole world. But in the 11th chapter, it said, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. I just want to bring to your uh I want to bring it to your attention that it, it says here, he beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Here in the 13th chapter, in the first two verses, that John saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns. It was like a leopard, had the feet of a bear. This is uh, verse two, mouth of a, a lion. Um, that was, it's going backwards from Rome, pagan Rome. Uh, the, the, the dragon gives him his power and that's pagan Rome, that's papal Rome, okay? That's the dragon, pagan Rome gives the papacy his power. But before him was the leopard, Greece. Uh, the seventh chapter of, of Daniel tells you this. Before Greece was me to Persia, the bear, and before the bear was the lion, which was Babylon. We're talking about natural dragon powers or world powers. They all came up out of the sea. They developed out of a world of civil powers. But in the 11th verse, this two-horned beast came up out of the earth. It was a religious development that developed the United States of America was developed out of religion, God-fearing man that fled the Eastern world. I mean, the Western world <clears throat> in the Eastern part that fled to the United States of America to build a country, one nation under God and set up a separation between church and state. 
the two horned beast that spake as a lamb. Horns are powers. And there was two powers, religious power and civil power. But even our civil father, our fathers that, that, that uh, constructed the Constitution of the United States were God-fearing men that feared the system that they came out of and came here for freedom of religion. And they made sure there would be a separation of church and state. And they, those two horns were like a lamb. They were lamb-like in their beginning. This nation was God-fearing lambs of God in their beginning. But then it says, and they spake as a dragon. See, the United States has... has our bureaucratic system has left off the fear of God, taking it out of schools, taking it out of courts, taking it wherever they could take it out of. See, because of the democratic system, and I certainly believe God helped our forefathers develop the democratic system, but it's short-lived. It, it's, it is a weak system. Uh, it has too many loopholes in it in the end. At first, they went by the spirit of democracy. One nation under God. This was a God-fearing country. They never dreamed that this the country would turn away from God and turn towards, you know, all kinds of uh, unclean living, unclean sexual living, unclean everything. Our forefathers never dreamed that would happen. They were lamb-like. They, they set up civil power to, to make peace and, and rule over the, the civil things to keep peace in this world while the church was developing. And they left that up to the ministry of God because back in those days, God was moving in a great way. He was moving in a great way. And... Uh, and developing in this nation, that, that God's done more in the United States of America than he's done for any country in the Gentile world since the church fell away. And it's going to set up, a, it's gonna build an image to the beast and it's gonna give its power to the beast. It had all the power, the beast before it. Read that in the 12th verse. And he, he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. The papacy, it will come back into power again. It will be the eighth head. I, I, I see the seventh head being set up here. So, hello, God bless you all for joining in. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm dealing with here the, the fact that this two-horned beast came up out of the earth, not out of the sea. I want you to see the difference there. If you go back to the seventh chapter of the book of Revelations right quick. I went over this, well, I know I did last week, but I want to get it established among some of y'all your hearts and, and your mind so you hear what I'm really saying. That in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, this is in the sixth seal and it's talking about the end. In fact, we're in the sixth seal now. And, and notice what it says. It says, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth. Um, and the wind that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. Notice that, three, three different elements. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice of the four angels, to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we've sealed our servants, the servants of God in their foreheads. See, he's, 
he here's what he the, he's saying that these four winds we've always taught these four winds were civil power military power financial power and religious power those four winds are blowing saints they're blowing the day is a type of it and elijah going up on mount horeb and hiding in the cave and and the winds begin to blow was the first thing that happened blew so hard that it busted rocks against the mountain the mountain is a mountain of religious and civil power a world power that's developing and winds are blowing mil civil powers military powers don't you see them blowing today and uh financial powers look this coronavirus has devastated our economy right now so uh those winds are blowing and then there's going to be uh what was next was it the earthquake and then there's fire uh, which is judgment. There's going to be an earthquake, a shaking. Uh, and uh, so here I'm reading to you here uh, that, that in the end of this world, until God makes up his bride, he is not going to allow the winds to blow to hurt the earth. And I'm saying that's this religious element that caused the United States to form and where his body will be restored and out of it will reach into these other countries that God's adding even now. Neither the sea, when it's talking about the sea, it's talking about the world, but God's not going to save ungodly. It's not the ungodly people that's talking about. It's talking about God's people that are out there in the world that have been uh, they've left the church and went out into the world. And there's many reasons people do that. Some people starve to death in religion. They don't get enough truth spiritually to keep them alive. Some people are victims. They're hurt. They've been hurt by, by men that don't have wisdom. Uh, you know, and that's the red horse stage. That's where we're at. The red horse rider had a, had a, and, and of course that was back there, the red horse where the church fell away, but we're back in it. We're out of the, we're no longer in the pale horse or the black horse where there's ignorance and not very much truth, but now we've got a lot more truth, but, but there has to be wisdom. See, that, that was given a sword, the rider of that horse was given a sword to hurt men. And many people have been hurt by men that don't have wisdom. Look, I'm not throwing off on men of God. It's just that until we develop to a point that we have wisdom, we're going to make mistakes. God knows that. He knew that that was going to be a price that was going to have to be paid until men could get closer and further in God, get some white hairs uh, in the horse, hurt not the sea. God's people that's out there, God's going to gather them back. They see this true manifested operation of God in the restored church. Many people will come out of the world back to the Lord. Nor the trees. Those are righteous trees. You should be called trees of righteousness, uh, Isaiah said. So I'm just touching on the earth again because I think this two-horned beast that came up out of the earth is... Uh, the United States of America. I'm sorry, but that's what I, that's my position on it at this time. I'm still considering uh, anything that I hear on it. That's the best that I have on it. And then uh, I guess I won't finish tonight because it's already, I've been on for an hour. So, uh, but we will, I will say this in the 16th chapter, if you'll notice this, we won't, I won't talk on each one of them, but I'll mention them. That, that these, you see in the 16th chapter, after God judges Babylon, then, uh, and that's in the last prophetical hour, and then in the last part, the last half of the last prophetical hour, 
God will pour out the seven vials of the last seven last plagues. And if you'll notice in 16th chapter, in the first verse, I'll just, I'll mention it. In uh, those seven vials of the wrath of God is gonna be poured out on the earth. No, verse two. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell grievous, uh, fell a noisome and grievous sore. Those are wounds, if you look it up, upon the men which had the mark of the beast and on them which had worshiped his image. That's the religious system I'm talking about that if God don't get them out of Babylon and they take the mark of the beast in his image, God is going to pour, he's gonna judge that system. Judgment's gonna fall on that system. I said I wasn't gonna talk on this, but okay, I'll just say what they are. The second angel poured out his vial upon the sea which became blood as the blood of a man and, and every living soul died in the sea. I'll go over it again this week, but I will tell you this. When God gets everything of his children out of the sea that can be got out of there and everyone else rejects it, he'll judge that. He'll judge the, the world will be judged and, and there won't be hope, any hope for anybody out there. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. Now, uh, that's what I want to talk about, and I'll, I'll try to give you a lot more in depth on that next week and go over these, these vials that's going to be poured out that's going to end in Armageddon, and then the thousand-year millennial reign will start. And we don't have much knowledge about the thousand-year millennial reign, but <clears throat> we know that God's going to clean up the whole world in a thousand years with his bride and Jesus Christ. That's took God to just make up a portion, just the bride in 6,000 years. What, what is going to take place for during that thousand years? I'm telling you, saints, strive to make the bride. Don't you want to be here and be a part of what God's going to do that's going to clean up the whole world and eat, eat everlasting life is going to be established during that thousand years and everything will be established in it in the end of it. If you're alive, you'll inherit eternal life, even as earth dwellers here on the earth if you're not in the bride. But wouldn't you like to be in the bride and be a part of what's going to bring all of that about? My God, hallelujah. I say this again. If you don't, if I don't make your shout, shout your shouter is broke. <laughs> God bless your hearts. Thank you for listening to me. I, I know I'm rehearsing some of this more than once, but I, I seem like God's helping me in it, and I just want you to get it. So I'm trying to bring your mind back up again to understand it. Again, let me announce, pray for Brother Gary Wright in Humble, Texas. You know, he's, this cancer condition that he has, let's pray that God would touch him. It seems like he's doing better. Uh, uh, let's keep praying for him. Uh, Brother, um, uh, somebody help me with uh, Brother Chuck Millsap in Wichita. Desperately needs your prayers. He's been in the hospital for weeks upon weeks, and he's been in a nursing home, now he's at home, and they've got a hospice called in if God doesn't touch him. We don't know what's gonna to happen to him, if he's gonna make it or not. So pray, pray for Sister Bernice, his wife, and the Wichita Assembly. He's been a faithful man of God to work with Brother uh, Gary Green there and the other brethren. Pray for them. Pray for those in our assembly. Uh, before I meant forget, I want to mention Sister, little Sister Bella uh, Veely, Brother Gary Veely's granddaughter that has cancer. Uh, she came through the surgery, and let's just keep praying that God will just touch the doctors, touch her, and raise her up from this terrible condition that she's went through. Uh, remember the Dominican Republic, the missionary works. Uh, I know that all the, I'm not as aware, of course, of the missionary works in the uh, uh, other countries, I'm aware of some of it, uh, but in the Dominican Republic, they're suffering. Uh, the lack
lack of food to eat. We're, we've been receiving some offerings. We thank all of you that sent us offerings. Uh, Haiti also has the same problem. I'm sure the Philippines and uh, Africa, uh, uh, Honduras, these other uh, military works, Ecuador, Mexico, all of them. We need to keep praying for them. I remember Brother Stone, uh, he's uh, needing our prayers physically. Also, Sister, uh, Sister Rhonda Oates, Brother Oates passed away this last week and they had his funeral. Keep praying for her, that God would keep her comforting her and helping her through this time and the family, uh, that God would comfort them uh, remember Brother Ray and Susan Weaver, Brother Shelby Weaver, Sister Abraham. These are people in our church. Sister Wilson, Sister Weiniger. Uh, remember <clears throat> all the needs that we have. Uh, the body overall, God would watch over them. Uh, pray for our leaders. If they'd help us get beyond this, uh, this coronavirus situation. Dear God, Precious Lord, God help us. Lord, we're in great need of your help during this time. Lord, touch your people. Touch this body and the ministers and the churches that we have and all of the needs. Oh, God, help us, Lord, each one in every state and even in these other countries. God, we ask you to watch over us. Help us, lead us, direct, and guide us into your will in a greater way, Father. Oh, God, we give you praise for your goodness and your blessings to us. We ask you in Jesus' name, Lord, to go with, us, go with us and help us to go with you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, God bless your heart, saints. Uh, I'll talk to you. Uh, Brother Clyde Quick says, pray for Elizabeth Quick in Cape Girardeau. They need our prayers. Brother Paul, God bless your heart. It's good to see you, have you on here with us. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, I pray for the work in Montreal. Uh, Brother, uh, uh, help me here. Brother, not only Brother Goss, but Brother, uh, <laughs> what's going on in my mind? They're in uh, Brother Goss's church. I just can't get in my mind who I'm wanting to mention here. But anyway, uh, pray for that work there and the, the work in, in Canada. Praise God. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, Brother brother McNabb, Brother Ron McNabb and his, his wife. He's, he's really been going through it physically in his body. Thank you, Brother Paul. God bless you all. Uh, we'll let you know if, if we uh, know anything further uh, about our church services right now. It looks like we will have church uh, on Wednesday night, April the 6th at 7.30, and again on Mother's Day, May the 10th. I, I said April 6th, but May the 6th and May the 10th on Mother's Day. We will let you know that for sure by this Sunday. If anything changes, we'll let you know. And we'll even call the saints if we need to. God bless you and good night. May the Lord be with you all.